зона – это очень сложная система ловушек, что ли. Но стоит тут появиться людям, как все здесь приходит в движение. исполнится ваше самое заветное желание, самое выстраданное. Welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is Bob Sham. I'm Angela. The sound you hear is dogs playing <laughs> in the hall right when we hit record. I gave them a non-squeaky soft toy. If you're listening, you can't see what I'm wearing at all. But if you're watching, and I encourage you to watch some of these. And describe what I'm wearing, Angela. You are shirtless. Yes, bitch. You have on a hooded house coat. That's right. Black and gray. You're wearing a silver chain. Mm -hmm. Your glasses, as always. And your newest piece of clothing, fashion, fashion accessory, your GQ bucket hat. That's right. Gentleman's Quarterly Magazine sent me this bucket hat. Yeah, they wouldn't send it to me if it wasn't High cool. fashion. High fashion. So now I'm rocking it. Now I'm put, wearing my GQ branded bucket hat to show everyone what the new wave, where we're going in the future in terms of look and style. Some people are fashion plates. I'm the whole goddamn China set that you set out <laughs> for holidays. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Gentlemen's Quarterly. That's what that stands for. A little American branding might balance out our discussion for today because this is a very Soviet film. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I may, when we were playing clips of this movie, I may have to put uh, the logos of American corporations in the corner to balance this whole thing out. Oh, Господи. Опять, кажется, наставление будет читать, судя по тону. We have the meat. Our theme this month is called Some Bullshit Tomorrow. Movies about dystopia, futuristic society, end stage humanity. What is going on in the future? Why did it happen? Well, it's a little vague here. Very vague. This move. This is our first discussion of an Andre Tarkovsky movie. This is the guy that many people worship, and he worshipped guys like Ingmar Bergman, which I think is pretty plain here. Definitely. There's a whole lot of lore surrounding this movie. It was a hit in the Soviet Union. A lot of it sold 4.3 million tickets. It cost about a million rubles total. And I think people just wanted to see what the fuck this movie that's been dragged out that cost so much film to, to do. And it garnered very mixed reviews. It's hard to imagine a movie like this being a big hit pretty much anywhere. But I think the rigmarole, almost like in an Ishtar kind of way, the rigmarole became infamous towards the movie. But in Ishtar, it resulted in people not seeing it. But in this one, people went to go see it. And people, as you could imagine, people were questioning Tarkovsky. This is a, a Soviet-funded film from Russia. Stalker from 1979, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. Written by Arkady Strugatsky and Boris Strugatsky. They wrote the screenplay based upon their novel, Roadside Picnic, and it stars Alexander Kadanovsky, Anatoly Selenitsyn. Sil 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 <laughs> Sil when, you're, when you're trying to be real fashionable, it's hard to, you don't really have time to memorize Russian name pronunciations. Nikolai Grinko, Elisa Friendlich. All right. In this movie, they apparently shot a whole movie, and the film of the original cut of it 
rotted, like something happened. So they had to remake the whole movie. And there's a lot of back and forth on what that original version was. There are claims that he shot this movie three different times. They had to go right back and do it all over again. He had a, a solid reputation that helped him. Very art. He was. He's globally very influential. And this movie, Stalker, is also credited perhaps for getting him sick and killing him and giving him cancer, because they shot in a lot of areas that were very industrial, and apparently there was a lot of pollution in the areas in which they shot, and a lot of people on involved in this production would get sick at a later time. And it's not 100% sure. There's a lot of presumption that Tarkovsky got cancer from his time making this movie. He made it once and it rotted. He made it again and people can't agree on whether it was different or the same. And then he uh, he allegedly made it a third time that maybe they cut it all together. Oh, This is what's strange because a lot of this is based upon what... Because pe- some people claim it was exactly a shot-for-shot shot remake who claim to have seen the first reel, and others say that it's completely different. There's just lore around this movie that is nothing is 100% sure of what happened or why. And he didn't comment on it because he passed away shortly after? I mean, he did interviews and talked about shit, but it really was high on his own supply, and he had the skills to back that up. The guy is really good. This is a beautiful film. Yeah, it manages to be beautiful in spite of what you see. It manages to be rich in spite of what seems to have so little. And also, this movie runs two hours and 45 minutes. A very patient movie. I think it would be a great prank if we can get, like, our family, as much of our families together as we possibly can. Right? And we sit down, kids and everything. We're going to sit around and watch Trolls World Tour. (laughs) Right? And about 10 minutes into the movie, when it starts into, like, the second song, then Tarkovsky's Stalker just starts playing. And people start asking questions, and we'll and we, we'll tell them, shut up, sit down and watch this fucking movie. It's only two hours and 45 minutes We long. are not pausing. You we are, are not, not pausing. getting up. I don't care if you have to sit use Sit down and watch this movie. Can you imagine, next time we visit your parents in Florida... Oh, you want to do a movie night? We got a great pick. We're going to have them watch Tarkovsky Stalker. This seems like, for so many people that we know in our lives... There's literally no way. This would feel like homework, right? Yeah. (laughs) They would get mad. (laughs) I appreciate this movie very much, and there were moments where it was a slog for me. It is a very patient movie. Slog is, is too... Much And there are moments where you just want the next thing to happen. I think slog is actually a perfect word. It feels like a slog with everything you're looking at. I think Tarkovsky is slogging it purposefully for sure. I think he's want he's forcing that he's he wants to force you to sit and study every part. There's parts where they're just on a rail cart and it's on this guy's head. Yes. One of the character's head. And I'm like Tarkovsky wants me to study this guy's fucking ear, right? I feel like I have this guy's ear ingrained in my memory. The opening credits are slow. He says the title like two, three times in the opening credits. He also puts this into two parts, both called Stalker. It fucked me up that there was no third part. I know, me too. Where's <laughs> There is a third part. An hour into but it. But they it, didn't say it. An hour into it, it's like part two, Stalker. And then, okay, once you get, when they get around the room, I'm You're like, waiting. I'm expecting for part three. I think he did that on purpose. Yes, also, there's a bit of fuckery There's so here. much conversation of, we have to hurry. Slow down. <laughs> we can't go in a straight line. We'll get there, but it's going to take a long time. I Be think- quick about it. Wait for me. The, I think the the big genius part of this movie is how it drags you along, I think. It's Absolutely. Just very, it, 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 and to sit here and we're analyzing it now, it's almost funny. Like, it's almost comical. There's one scene in particular where they need to get through a tunnel. It feels very much like a sewage 
tunnel. There's garbage all over the floor. There's water all over this movie. This movie is wet. Very wet. I don't like element of crime. Uh, Lars von Trier worships Tarkovsky. He's made it plain and clear. It's been pretty obvious. Yeah, it's and, very obvious in this, or in watching this, that he took so much inspiration from it. Yeah, an element of crime, very wet movie, just like this one. An element of crime came out only like a few years after this, this one did. This movie is about this man who is a stalker who takes people into the zone. They tell us at the beginning there's some history given words and a poem at the beginning and they want us to understand that the world was one way and then something happened whether it was a meteorite or something from outer space which a meteorite is from outer space but or the a idea nuclear is that bomb exactly but where did it come from and that changed this world we're in this unnamed village town and very industrial. And it has a um, yellow filter on it. We we last encountered a yellow filter for reflections in a golden eye. And I criticized it a little bit. I the felt PP like filter, The PP filter. It. And I thought it was a little contrived. I understood the basic concept based on the title of the fucking movie, what they were trying for. It's not contrived here. No. It's mysterious here. Because when they go beyond the town, finally... Everything goes back into color. The movie uh, seems to allude that, no, this is just what this town is like. When you're in this town, this little post-industrial shit town, everything just looks yellow. There's this illusion of coming out of the fog into the color. And there are times when they're outside of the town where there's yellow moments, but it seems like when they're laying down, resting, dreaming. Or memories. Th memories. That's when it goes back to being yellow. But this guy... Uh, he's th their names are it's three men it's just the stalker the writer and the professor and he has a wife and a child whose name is monkey or he calls her monkey and that's the only name she apparently is disabled she can't use her legs and something happened too that mutated her that they make a reference to they reference it as though so he goes to the zone stalkers there's more than one stalker but he's the one that we follow they take people into the zone. And we learn through the course of this movie that the idea is you go to the zone, you cannot go alone, you need a guide because it's very dangerous. But if you can make it to the heart of the zone, your deepest, most desire... A room, if you can make it to a room. You can get your deepest, most desire, but you have to make it all the way there and go into the room... And you can ask for something, but what it's going to give you is what you really want. Yeah, you can and you can try to fake it, but it's going to give you what. You, yeah, it, you, what what's in your heart, not what you. If you have a more practical wish, like oh, I want this to, but what you really want is something else. It's going to give you what you really want. Exactly, and because as you mentioned, they don't know if this was a meteorite, some other thing from outer space, a bomb, whatever it was. They say that the daughter was crippled. She's a mutant, a zone child. Mm. So the fact that he has gone into the zone multiple times, they want you to believe that it's his fault that his daughter is crippled because he has brought back this radiation or this other worldliness that has affected her. This almost three hour long movie... Uh, it is takes its time. It's very slow, but I feel like we could talk about everything that happens within 15 minutes. We could, but then talking about why and what it means could, could be, be five hours. Exactly. Well, when they go into the zone, and if this was made in America, the zone would be a giant auto zone. Get in the zone. And they would walk around looking for a headlight they need to exchange that they can't find and not get anyone to help them. And the only thing they would have to eat is piz zones. Remember when Pizza Hut had piz zones? What's a zone? Piz zones, for no. those who don't know, are cow zones that Pizza Hut used to sell. But they couldn't just call them cow zones. They were piz zones. That would be the American version of Stalker. But this is not the American no. version of Stalker. So The zone looks nicer than the town. 
people are banned from the zone. They have to maneuver around these police guys in the city, driving through very badly, but everything's also in rubble until they find a rail car that can go out of the zone. And it, and they do, they go out and this rail track, since it, they don't go deep into the zone, it just stops. And then that's where they are. And everything is in color, kind of drab, like your Eastern European landscapes might look like. Uh, if you remember, um, come and see, it was kind of like that as well. But yeah, it, the zone looks more pleasant than the town that they came from. But there's a fear of the zone. While they're trying to get to the zone and sneaking through this military guarded area, they're getting constantly shot at. They are, like you said, very badly, very loudly sneaking around. People are but not allowed to go into the when zone. When they get to a certain point, the writer says, well, aren't they just going to keep following us? And Stalker says, no. They will not come here. They are afraid. The first thing they come across when they get into the zone, well, a couple things happen. They come out of the fog. They're into the color. They send the railroad car back. And the writer says, well, how are we going to get back? And he says, no one goes back the same way they came Mm. from the zone. He goes off on his own. The stalker goes off on his own, and he finds a place in the grass and just lays there. It's as though he is being energized by this place. He talks to his wife before he leaves. She's begging him not to go because he's just come back from prison, presumably for take, getting caught taking people into the zone. Right. And she says, they'll send you back for longer if you get caught again. Don't leave us and you'll be a prisoner. And he says, I'm a prisoner everywhere. You get the idea that the only place he doesn't feel like a prisoner is in the zone. Get in the zone! Stop it. <laughs> we need to um, westernize this, Angela. While he's off laying in the grass, he has the professor tie these bolts onto these long white bandages. And as they're walking through the zone, he has all these rules and the writer from the beginning, from before they even left, is a problem. He wants to drink alcohol. He has a gun. Professor, not quite as talkative, you just assume, is just wants to take in information. The writer says that he wants to find inspiration again because he's lost his will to write. Yeah, and the professor seems to just be curious about it. They bicker back and forth, but the writer so is much. often analyzing the whole point of his entire existence he doesn't seem to be really getting inspiration through this process. Or it, open to it. It just seems to be causing him to question himself and his motivations and the point of everything he's doing more and more and more as they go deeper and deeper into the zone. And everywhere they go in here, like, they come across these just blown out cars and there's corpses in there. Tanks even. And you see men holding guns and... But no one's trying to grab those guns. Guns come into play later. Like, we see guns underwater. To imply that, you know, touching these guns is just going to end up in your demise, right? Absolutely. And, and we don't actually visibly see any kind of force that is destructive. But it's just constantly reiterated by the stalker what you can and can't do. You think you can just walk into these woods. And the stalker's like... No, no, you got to, like, maneuver around or walk in a different way. There's one point where they are, what, 30 meters from a house? Yeah. And the stalker says, it's right in front of us. And the writer just goes like he's going to walk to it on his own. And the stalker says to him, please do not do this. You cannot just walk straight there. You have to roundabout get there. There are traps everywhere. It's different every time. You come here. The yeah, they, reason with the bolts is he's throwing to tell them where to walk to next because he stops every 20, 30 feet max that they walk at a time. But he has to stop every time and listen and figure out where the wind is coming from and if there's danger. There is implication that this landscape changes. Like he it says shifts. that he's seen people die here, too. So if you don't follow the rules, it could be fatal. And, well, this guy, he goes to walk in, the writer goes to walk into this place and he's, he hears a voice that says, stop. And he thinks one of them said it. No, neither of them did. But he's also gotten scared. The wind has picked up and he turns back. He does question, they all question each other. Did you say that? I didn't say that. And obviously the zone warned him to not approach in that way. It then appears to take them two days to get 
to yeah. this room that was right in front of the them passage, at one point. The passage of time is odd here. It'll be light and then dark. Sometimes they have to go underground. They're going into tunnels and, and they're looping around. And when they get separated and but come back together, the stalker is always surprised. Like, oh, I did not think we would see you again. There's a knapsack that the professor leaves at one point, And he's very concerned about having left it. He needs to go back and get it. And then the stalker and the writer realize he's not there. They get back to him. And the stalker thinks they've found a trap. He thinks they're in the middle of a trap, but decides this is where we should rest. Let's all take a nap. It seems like the zone won't let them be apart. When the writer tries to go into the house alone, the zone says, stop, come back. When the professor goes off on his own to get his knapsack the zone brings the people back to him because this is a space they've already been in they've then now traveled in apparently a circle to get back together the zone wants them to stay together they get to this tunnel point and they draw matches to see who's going to go first because they're very close at this point point. and I, I i get the writer and the professor confused as to who did what when but I think it's the writer that goes It is the first. writer, yeah. And very drawn out. It seems as though they are in that tunnel for 30 minutes. The writer pulls out a pistol and the stalker's like, no, don't do that. Everything we see, guns are just litter. They're trash in this environment. It seems like anyone that held a gun is destroyed. We see the men in the cars. We see guns in like waterways and stuff. And this guy... He convinces him to put the gun down and to go into the room, which is adjacent to the room that wishes gives you your desires. Mm-hmm. And when he sets the gun down and the stalker comes up, he pushes the gun into the water. But he doesn't just kick it. it he does Very it careful. so carefully, just slowly pushes it. Like, he's, like he thinks if he goes slow enough, then something won't see him do it. He doesn't want... It to notice he's even touching it is how it feels. And the stalker, he tells the stories of past people that he has helped. And this one guy that he keeps bringing up called Porcupine. That's who taught him this. That was a stalker. Porcupine was a stalker before him. Maybe I'm getting the stories confused. Did Porcupine come with his brother Mm -hmm. who died in the tunnels? Mm -hmm. And then Porcupine wished for his brother to come back. That was the thing he wished for when he he got there. He wished for his brother to come back. But when he went back into the world... Within weeks, he had a ton of money. Yeah. And he got arrested and he hung himself. What comes around, the writer actually explains it to the stalker. He says to him, your friend killed himself because he got what his innermost desire was, but he went in asking for his brother to be saved. And the realization that what he thought he wanted was not really his innermost desire. He really wanted money even above his brother's life. And realizing that made him kill himself. Yeah. He didn't see any way to move forward from that. But Porcupine was called Teacher when the stalker first followed him in. The stalker also says, beyond Porcupine, he doesn't know what's happened to anyone that he has brought into the zone because you don't get your wish immediately. So the people he has successfully returned to the world, they go off and he never knows what happens to them. This could kill more people than we realize. This getting what you want and either realizing that what you want is so superficial that the, it's depressing. They asked the stalker why he's never made any wish and stalkers are not supposed to go in and he's like i just don't need that you know i'm doing this for other people and it's just it's just not necessary for me to do that that's how he describes it one point near the end his wife asks him do you want me to go you can take me there i'll go into the room and he says no because what if you fail He touts this as it's going to give you your innermost desires. It's the greatest thing. It's going to give you clarity and knowledge and all of this. I think he's ultimately afraid of it. And he doesn't want his wife to go there because he's seen so many people fail. And he's even seen people die. Even if she wished something that made their life easier, that it was for their daughter to walk. Who knows? I think he ultimately is afraid of what is it that she really wants. 
but he's proud of what he does. He takes great pride in it. He he does. He, he's fearful of it, but fearful in the way one might be devout to God. Well, the writer points out that he feels like a god in that space. He brings people there, and he's the one who has the knowledge. They have to rely on him to get there and to come back. He says at one point he doesn't do this for any other reason than bringing people to this place to get their wishes, but they fucking pay him. Oh, and throughout this movie, a black dog is following them around. And black dogs have, uh, you know, bad omen parallels throughout multiple media interpretations and books and shit like that. But they're next to the room and they're all just looking in and the professor pulls out a bomb. We're going to blow this up. This place is too dangerous. It could it's it could destroy good people. It could give too much to bad people. We're going to destroy this. And I got to say, I was kind of on his side. Yeah. But as they keep talking through it, he is essentially convinced to dismantle the bomb and just leave it there. But they're standing adjacent to the room, and it starts to rain, like, in, in the, the room. room. Going back and forth on what they want. The press wants to, to destroy it. The writer wants inspiration, but it's only just further deepened his self-doubt. No one goes into the room. No one. No one does. There's also a weird moment before we find out that the professor has the bomb where they're in a very small room. And so many of these images look like paintings. This is one that does to me, too. They, they're so still in certain moments. But they're in this very tiny room, and a phone rings. Oh, yeah. And the stalker says, don't touch it. But the, per the, the writer answers it and says, no, this isn't the laboratory, and hangs up the phone. The professor goes over and picks up the phone and dials a number. And he is theoretically speaking to one of his contemporaries who... Yeah. I'm assuming is one of the folks that helped him create this bomb that they then hid from him. And he says to them, I found it. I found it and I'm here. I'm steps away from the room and I'm going to do it. The man on the other line accuses him of only wanting to destroy this room to get back on that man for having slept with his wife 20 years ago. <laughs> which maybe. Maybe. And it's very interesting. He shouldn't be able to call this place. That man shouldn't have been able to call and for him to call out is very weird. Made me wonder if that was also the zone. If the zone knows all these things about them, it knows he has this bomb, but it also took him back to that bomb and took his friends back to that bomb to lead him into this room. And there's part of me that wonders if the room wants to be destroyed. Yeah, I kind of had that thought too, but ultimately they choose not to. And no one goes in. And it cuts back to a bar where Yellow again, and the black dog is hanging out with them. The bar is also where the three of them met up right before they left. So the wife shows up. With the little girl. And the husband's like, please don't chase the dog off or whatever. And There's a weird thing about the writer saying he has six dogs and she says, yeah. oh, well, you like dogs. That's good. Yeah, he said, I already have five of them or something. The stalker says something along the lines of, that he's going to bring his family to go live there. He says that when they're outside the room, they all have this moment outside the room. That's when the writer says to the stalker, you think you're God here. The writer realizes he can't go in because he's not a good person. And he doesn't, you have to be humble to go in the room. And he knows he's not going to, it's not good for him. The professor, you know, has his bomb moment. In that moment, the stalker says, maybe I should bring my family here. Maybe we should just live here forever there's a point after the bar scene where you see him walking with his family and there's a factory just pumping chemicals and they're in color in the background and it is in color so it implies that they are maybe just a little bit into the zone and is the factory a part of their town because it does seem to me that tarkovsky is giving some message about the stagnation of perhaps this 
later era Soviet state, this post-industrialization that seems to made a lot of people sick in some way. Yeah, and this cold, industrial, bleak landscape versus nature where you cannot have guns. Yeah. And you cannot... It won't let you. Yeah, you cannot be violent or loud. And as dangerous as it is, is just looks more enticing than the actual town, the yellow-soaked pee-pee filter town that you live in. It comes back to... Them at their apartment that we see at the top, where it is all yellow, and the and wife she's putting him to bed, and the wife monologues directly to the camera, talking yeah. about like what it's like to be married to a stalker, and how you know her family didn't want this, think, but it's better to have an interesting life through this way than a basic life, and how you have to have sorrow because if you don't have sorrow, you can't experience happiness. It seemed like she was pretty regretful at the beginning of the movie. Of his- She was regretful when she was giving this monologue, too. It felt very self-convincing. But I do believe she loves him. She does. I don't know if she's completely lying to herself. I think maybe at the beginning she's just... You know, he's been locked up for this. So that's kind of the thing she's the most worried about, right? I think she does take his side on what he chooses to do here. I think Tarkovsky is talking about how we maybe need a little bit of faith. And maybe we're just a little stagnant. And I and a little faith can break that up. And the stalker represents faith. And the stalker's... he advocates for himself and then what he thinks is the good for other people but he thinks it's beautiful and important and he is distraught at the end crying in the bed telling her they didn't deserve it i don't know if anyone deserves it and that's when she says to him i'll go with you do you want me to go i'll go and he says no because i don't want you to fail he doesn't want to be disappointed in her because he needs her He doesn't want to lose her. And if they were to go and she were to fail, whatever that means to him, whether she dies or she wishes for something bad or she just doesn't go, he can't look at her the same after that. Then she will have disappointed him also. And he can't survive that. Then we cut to the very end. The daughter. in color. And this is when I wonder, are they now in the zone? Did they go to the zone? I don't know. But the daughter is in color sitting at a table. She's his own baby. The shots remember? in this movie are fucking like gorgeous. Great, if you want. But the the glasses are lined up in f- in front of this little girl, and you see the shot. And I I, I immediately notice like the way they're lined up, and then the little girl starts moving the glassware around, or it appears that she's moving it around with her mind. Mm-hmm. And one glass she like mentally shoves off the table. I have to wonder how Tarkovsky did that effect wise, you know. Um, was there little strings that we didn't see? She I'm was very still. That. I wondered that too. They're right by a rail station or a train track. And it starts shaking. And it starts to shake. So it om- I think he's trying to make you doubt that she maybe did that. That maybe the shaking, I don't know, it seems well, way too convincing that now she has telekinetic powers. So the very first scene we ever get, the mother, the daughter, and the father are laying in bed. And he's awake, but they're not. And it starts at this table. And the glass is moving because of the railway station. And this is another moment where he so slowly pans over the entire bed and back. And it's just this very deliberate, slow movement. But we do see the glass move because of the train. Also, the fact that it's in color made me think... Is Does she see in color because she's from the zone? If they are in their apartment, does she have some sort of heightened senses? And there's also the idea of, sure, her legs don't work, but she can do other things. They might be extraordinary. And she looks so incredibly sad. And that's the end of the movie. I mean, she is Russian. Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky. Yeah, this is um, our first Tarkovsky movie. Definitely something to behold. We're going to give this one through five each combined for best out of ten. What do you give the 1979 film Stalker? I think I'm going to give it a 4.5. Is this truly an S? I can't decide. I'm, that's a lot why of I'm pe- right there. Cause a lot of, I mean, nine is a fucking great score. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people are like, this is full S. But 
I think I'm at a 4.5 as well. I think a nine on the cusp. I'll say 4.75. All right, so we're going S We're going S tier. Folks, check it out. Stalker by Andre Tarkovsky is an S tier movie from 1979. And it rests between the films Sunset Boulevard by Billy Wilder and uh, a movie called Shirkers by Sandy Tan, a documentary from 2018. Now, you, you, for those who've only watched uh, or listened to Movie Umpers, you may be wondering, like, when did you talk about that movie? <laughs> I have transferred a lot of things we've discussed on our old podcast, Documenteers, in which we just talked about documentaries. And I've transferred uh, a certain amount of movies from there into our current rating Switch the ratings around. We think about movies differently since that time. But uh, yes, Shirkers by Sandy Tan from 2018 is uh, one of those that we have bumped to an S tier documentary. And uh, right there, right next to Andre Tarkovsky's Stalker. Maybe we'll do a little extra episode ta- going through all the documentaries, revisiting them that we have transferred into this rating system. Um, but. Well, when I get time trying to figure that out, I overbook myself for this show. That said, our first Tarkovsky movie in the bag. I saw Solaris once a long time ago. Uh, I think they remade that with George Clooney. I don't know if Mm. you remember that. Mm -hmm. But there's plenty more uh, Tarkovsky movies that I I need to see. Uh, One called like The Mirror. I think they played that at the Bell Court. We didn't get to it, but... I heard that one's pretty amazing as well. So check the show notes for links, other places to find us. Like, subscribe, leave a comment. Tell us what you think about Stalker or any other Tarkovsky movie. And um, yeah, let's get out of here. I'll see you tomorrow. Quentin the Show. It's something really tasty now at Pizza Hut. Order any large pizza for the family. And for just $2.99 more, mom and dad get a pizzone of their own. Quentin the Show. Delicious toppings and cheese sealed inside a golden folded pizza crust. And three yummy recipes. So while the rest of the family's in pizza paradise, you've got a pizzon big enough to share. Or maybe not. Now, only $2.99 when you get any large pizza at the regular price. Only from Pizza Hut.